Hey, hey, honey. No, no, this business trip is going great over here in the UK and France. Man, I've been so busy, I've had, like, no time to think. I mean, they are keeping me busy all day, every day, all day, every day. I, I have no time to do anything else. I I'll talk to you later. Bye. Ole, 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 ole. Ole, oh. I forgot to turn up the phone. Dang it. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey everybody, welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. I am excited and delighted once again to have you here with me each and every week. Be sure to uh, check out the all-new NoVacancyNews.com. Let me know what you think about it. And, of course, if you are not subscribing to the show, I got an easy way to do it. Just text the word HOTEL to 66866. That's HOTEL to 66866. It only takes a second, and the rewards will last a generation. So, anyway, this show is brought to you in part by du Duetto, the revenue strategy te technology platform that thousands of hotels are using to make more money. So right now, um, they have this cool thing on GetRevenueResults.com. I'm telling you, drama, intrigue, passion, where you can follow an adventure of a committed team of hoteliers. They're lost in a world of spreadsheets, disconnected strategies, and poor communication from a lack of the right technology. But when they commit to a revenue optimization strategy, their world changes in ways they never imagined. Watch the video, How Hotel Management Teams Can Collaborate to Make More Money. Oh, man, that was really silly. But anyway, go to GetRevenueResults.com. GetRevenueResults.com. So I got to tell you, I'm here. I'm in, uh, where am I? I'm in Paris, and I'm with uh, my producer, Art Lurie, who I work with on the here to Stay TV. Art, how are you? Very well. How do you think I am? England were knocked out of the World Cup last night. Uh, well, yeah, and I was with you at that time. I think we were somewhere under the English Channel yep. uh, when, when it occurred. And uh, we went in. All Things were looking good. We were headed into the tunnel, came out, it was just sadness and despair all around. Absolutely. But, um, hey. We we did we did pretty well. So, what more can I say? <laughs> Next time, <laughs> right? Wow, yeah, the, 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 I love I love the energy. Did I tell you about GetRevenueResults.com? dot com? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> be sure to go there. And also, Art, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, thank you to Red Roof for becoming a big sponsor of the show. Very excited to have them on board. This is so awesome to have a big hotel brand uh, joining the No Vacancy Podcast. You can hear more about them during the break. But right now, I got to talk about a really cool place. Um, at Art, we're in the middle of uh, Paris, somewhere on a a, a road which is a uh, Rue La Rue? Rue La Rue, which is just off of Victor, oh, Avenue Victor Hugo, yeah. Yeah, which is in the 16th arrondissement. Oh, so we're in a, uh, a fancy, uh, snooze, it's, snazzy it's a part of fancy town. fancy place. It's, you know, it's, it, this is, you know, as I explained to you before, this is Paris of Parisians. It, it really is. And what we are doing is we are at the, uh, the all-new Mode Apart Hotel. And this is exciting because you all know um, I've been very interested in extended stay. And this is kind of combining the worlds of the service department industry with extended stay with a lot of those typical hotel services. So it's a, a whole new brand kind of thing, mashup deal that was, uh, that's really interesting. And I think it covers a lot of the different trends that are happening now in uh, hospitality. So... Uh, yay, we get to stay in an apartment art here in uh, the, the middle of Paris. And I should say, I am in uh, outdoor mode right now because we're yeah. recording from a beautiful courtyard. It's fantastic. I mean, a sort of summer evening like this, it's just it's such a great place to be. And it's quiet, you know, right in the middle of the city. And it's just wonderful. Yeah, it really feels like a place of serenity, doesn't it? So we, we were here, we're, we're shooting great videos for Here to Stay TV, and I really got to um, experience this whole part hotel kind of uh, concept. And um, it, it's fun to me because I, I get the, uh, the kitchenette and the refrigerator and all of these extra type of amenities in a great space, but it feels very similar to a hotel experience. It is, and it's sort of, it, it's something I think that we will touch on when we talk about Service Department Summit, and that is the, the concept of the apart hotel, you know, so the, and this has been a long time coming, this was developed by um, Bridge Street, you know, and they're working with um, a great um, set of American architects called uh, Swatch Room, based in Washington, really talented people, and and as you know, I've been involved with this, you know, in 
I do. Lots of different aspects of this. I project. do. And I almost feel like this is this, this whole project has uh, been your baby because you keep dropping these little nuggets. Like here, I, I think you know you're just you're producing our video segments. I get to hang out with you. You know, have some good meals. But uh, you know, all of a sudden, it, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. You see that thing? I did that whole thing. I came up with this concept. I did this. I had a well. You were meeting with a florist today. What is going? Yeah, on? I don't know. I didn't expect that, but that was wonderful. You know, it is sort of you know, what are we going to do? You know, you, it's everything. You know, and it's sort of. As we spoke about, these kind of concepts are very much about storytelling. And it's, you know, what's the story you want to tell? And, you know, the idea here was to, you know, be really local, you know, be very modern, but modern with this nice mix of the old and the heritage of this site, which is astonishing, you know. But, right. um, yeah, because now I got to say two of my favorite words in hospitality, adaptive reuse. The first, you know, the, the build, there's two separate buildings and we're in a courtyard. One is a, a newer modern building where the majority right. of the rooms are located. But then you have all the, uh, <coughs> the other stuff in the older building, which it's great to see all this old architecture. And I just feel so cool sitting well, here. Well, these were, these were these just offices. Buildings. You know, these beautiful yeah. 19th century, you know, um, neoclassical buildings were offices. You know, run down, you know, and now look at them, you know, just fantastic. Yeah. And we're like, uh, you know, a, a block from the uh, the metro or right near the uh, Arc de Triomphe. And it's uh, such a great location. But what I liked about it, and um, I'm going to totally steal art stuff right here ah. because I have no clue what's going on. But he pointed out a great fact that it's like here we get to hang out with the locals and it's very away from things. But just a hundred yards up the road, or I should say, a hundred meters, since I'm in uh, Europe. I mean, right give now. it a couple of hundred. Meters, a couple of hundred yeah, meters yeah. up the road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you have the Arc de Triomphe, and that starts like land of tourism, and yeah. the atmosphere completely switches. It's like whoosh, all of a sudden, we're in the middle yeah. of everything. Yeah, here, you know, th- this, you know, we're right in the middle of the 16th arrondissement. You know, that is, you know, that that shorthand for this is where the the well to do hung out. You right. know? So if you know you were living in Paris and you're in the 16th, you know that was the place to be. You know, I think one street away, you know, is known as the you know most expensive street in Paris. You know, it's sort of, but it's it's relaxed, isn't it? It's sort of it's it's just yeah, great place to be. It really is, and I especially like that. Um, you know, there's a Boulevard Hausman and all of that well, you would going like on. That. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. such it was so great because finally I'm getting some respect in Paris. I've been trying, and now they've named everything after me up and down this whole street. So it's really an honor. That, 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 that <laughs> especially happened. for you, of course. They've waited a long time yeah, for you. Of course, the name's spelled wrong. Yeah. I'm not related to the guy. <laughs> I have no credit. I don't deserve any of it. But it's just fun to have something like that. And I got to get a picture of me like pointing at a sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th- this is your first trip to Paris. How's it been? Uh, it's been pretty good so so far. It, it's interesting because um, I don't know what what it was like for you growing up in the UK, but I think from an American perspective, there's this thing with Paris that's just reflected in mass media culture, right? Yeah. So it's all about that that romance and stuff. And uh, yeah, we drove by in a taxi on the Eiffel Tower, but Fleeting. I didn't feel I didn't yeah, fe- yeah I, I yeah. didn't feel a, a a swoop of love and emotion overcome me and. Uh, you know, it's beautiful, great weather, but I'm not thinking, like, oh, Paris in the spring, you know, all of no, that kind of no. stuff. It's like a regular city, yeah. you know, but it's really nice. It's great. And um, the people here seem to know how to live life. Uh, yeah. And as we as we said and as we observed, they know how to stop. Yep. You know, during the middle of the day or whenever during you know, during the day. Or, you know, in the mornings, and afternoons, maybe later in the evenings. That's it. <laughs> Just stop, sit yeah. down, have a coffee, read a book. You yeah. Know. That's it, you know, and it's it's fantastic, you know. They, they've got the lifestyle balance right. Yeah, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for setting up a really fun thing that we did today that you'll be able to see on Here to Stay TV, where we spoke with a uh, a New Yorker who relocated 13 years ago to Paris, and he's been doing um, video blogs and all of that ever since, and doing tours. And we got a chance to get some inside local tips from him. That's a fun video. I can't wait to see how that comes out. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna edit that one quickly. I mean, Richard was fantastic, and I think you. You both just hit it off immediately, didn't you? It it's was really great. funny that we know some of the same people back in New York. I mean, it's crazy. It's such a big world, but it's such a small world. Yeah. Well, there you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> just like that song, It's Small World, and which I understand Disneyland is just uh, 20 kilometers uh, outside yeah. town. So. I'm sure we're going to get a report on that. Oh, we might. <laughs> we, we just might. We'll see, how, we'll see how the weekend goes. I don't know. I may just stay in town for uh, Bastille Day. I think that'll be uh, fun. It's that Saturday. Yeah. yeah. There's going to be a huge parade here in town. That's yep. pretty cool. Yeah. 
So let's uh, let's reverse that a, a little bit. We're having a great time here in Paris. Uh, obviously, you could hear it in um, the, uh, the the deep of my uh, my voice right now. Oh no, I'm getting a phone call, but I'm not going to accept it. Um, so uh, now let me, I now I got to reset because I got distracted. We are we were here. We are in Paris, but we weren't always here in Paris. We arrived last night um, via the Eurostar train from London, where we we're at the Service Department Summit. But before we get that, I want to do that. I got to do something on that channel thing because it was so cool for me getting to ride through the channel, you know, that first time ever because it's such a massive feat of engineering. I know it has nothing to do with our topic of hospitality, but seriously, it is, it is, yeah. so, it is so cool. It's so amazing. I've always wanted to ride that. Plus, we got to go on a train that went 300 kilometers an hour. Uh, you know, the, the fastest the F train goes is about seven miles an hour, you know? <laughs> it was great. It was sort of, yeah, and, you know, you had a little meal. It was yeah, you know, lovely way to get there, you know, and no airports. <laughs> which is great I, I really enjoyed that too um, so I highly recommend doing the, uh, the channel but uh, back, in, uh, back in London we attended the service department summit now I've been having the, uh, the pleasure since I've been working on here to stay TV to be uh, attending all of these types of service department events and in this last year and a half I've been awoken to a whole new universe that's out there um, that universe includes the uh, aforementioned service department uh, extended stay category in general these new apart hotels and some other little t- twists on interesting new concepts that's uh, very different than what we've experienced. And I, I think our, to bring uh, you know, listeners up to, to speed about what this whole industry is about, yes, it's always been there, but it's kind of been hiding, yeah. lurking in the background because they didn't have the right technology to make it ever-present. But ever since Airbnb burst onto the scene, it seems to have catalyzed the, uh, the industry, that's, uh, the extended stay business, to kind of come together and figure out new ways. Bridge Street pulled it all together with BridgeStreet.com where you could get more um, real real-time availability and bookability on properties. And all of this has changed the game. And now everybody seems to be noticing it. Everybody seems to be really into it. So there's a whole sector now. Service Department News, our great, uh, you know, our great friend Piers Brown over there, puts together the Service Department Summit, Service Department Summit Americas, Service Department Summit Recharge. And we get to go to all of them, which and is And Asia fun. coming up And as Asia's well. coming yeah. up. And uh, yes, uh, in Bangkok. So I'm hoping that we'll get to go to that one. I don't know about the EM... The the, uh, the Middle Eastern one, though, that'll be uh, that'd be really cool. Absolutely. I'm planning on uh, I'm planning on sweating either way. If, if I'm there, if I'm not there, <laughs> we'll see. OK, so um, it was a great day and a half. Um, you know, I highly recommend everyone go back to our show that we did in January where Art and I were in uh, Amsterdam at the Recharge event at the Zoku Hotel, uh, the Zoku place. And uh, over a couple of beers, we did a show and we really talked about um, the, the industry from at that time. So the state of the industry now, it seems like all of a sudden in this apart hotel thing and it's curious that we are at a brand new apart hotel that just opened um seems to be at the fore of everyone's mind it is everyone it, that's the yeah i'm not saying it's the flavor of the month but it is sort of it, something's clicked everyone's talking apart hotel you know and it's sort of we were asking people why and we've got some great you know responses from people on that but um I think that's well, it. I, I think it? it's an interesting you know, thing about, that I just think in general in life you don't hear about something, then all of a sudden it seems yeah. to spread and become part of the zeitgeist like almost overnight. It's an interesting phenomenon. You see it time and time again. You know, but, but there was there was a time where I didn't know of chicken and waffles. Then all of a sudden it was just there and everywhere. It's exactly. I mean, it's sort of it's it's moving the sector. You know, the extended stay service department sector away from that. You know, sort of homogenized product into defined offerings mm-hmm. you know and defined stories you know people were actually talking stories you know we went to um you know new concept by stay city you know right. in off the strand in london which was wild you know how was that for you i mean uh, why it was wild but it's called wild, wild yeah, yeah. <laughs> no it was it was nice and um I, I gotta tell you after staying here at mode and wild there's a lot of uh, similarities in the um the energy that's yeah. trying to be created and the way it's all put together, um, you know, the, it, it, they're all cleverly uh, designed. They have a very specific uh, approach. So it's almost taking um, a semblance of the boutique hotel approach, putting them on to apartments in cool neighborhoods, right? That wild hotel really reflects, uh, you know, the Oscar Wilde scene that was going on in that particular part of, uh, yeah. of London, right? Uh, so really fascinating uh, to me that hotel. Uh, but we also art, which I thought was great, is I had the opportunity to um, to host a, a a session where three people presented their three new brands. Uh, 
the one that we should talk about first, I think, is uh, the one called Stowaway because we kind of got a sneak peek. Um, we got to go see this cool brand, um, you know, Stowaway under construction. Waterloo. Yeah, yeah just want, tell, tell us about what we saw. Stowaway Waterloo. Um, that's developed by well, the Seal Capital and Stow Projects, um, and that will be managed by Bridge Street, you know, ongoing basis. Fantastic concept. Um, so it's a complete mini hotel built from shipping containers. But yeah. So they took these 20 shipping containers, stacked them all up of each other, and then some of the uh, the parts that they cut out where they connected them, they put these uh, these cool things up front, like little uh, pieces of uh, art that kind of block out the sun, some like shade <sighs> yeah, type thing. Yeah, I'm making it. a lot of hand yeah. gestures right now that you guys can't I see. I didn't know that, but it radio. makes sense now. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and uh, so it's got this cool, neat design element to it. It's, uh, it's just 20... 20 rooms. Um, 20 each rooms. one is a shipping container. Yeah, so that's but cool. So there's 24 never, shipping containers. You yeah, would the first never floor know it. The, no. You'd never know it inside. No, you step inside, and it's a cool, modern, hip, boutique hotel. They're going to have, like, a little wine bar yep. um, at the bottom. And um, all the rooms, again, it's a shipping container, but laid out in a very clever way that you don't feel like you're in a small space such as a shipping container. Yeah, absolutely. High-quality materials. Just right. great. You know, and I think it will... I think word of mouth will shift right. that product because all, people will just love it. Yes. Although I would be scared I'd fall asleep and maybe wake up on a boat going to China or yeah, something well, like that. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. I really look forward to seeing uh, that particular uh, property open. But I think um, one really cool concept that I, I enjoyed hearing all about was the whole idea of this brand Cuckoo's and uh, Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're fabulous. I mean, this is sort of, you know, very much a... A female-driven company, um, Cuckoos. I mean, they seem to be growing like crazy. Um, mainly east east end of London, isn't it? You know, with right. beautifully designed apartments. And on top of Cuckoos, they brought in this concept, which is called Cuckoos Nest, which is shared workspaces with adjacent nursery you know like childcare. yeah that's ter- that's a such a, a, a terrific idea yeah because we are so into this co-located workspace thing everybody in the united states knows we work we work serendipity labs a lot of other companies that have emerged out there but um nobody you know everyone associates them with the young hip millennials and everyone having a drink after work but you know what there's also folks that have families and it's very difficult for um for you know for people to um, afford child care and be able to be productive at the same time so uh cuckoo's nest offers up a uh, a great opportunity there to book for as little as two hours it's based on a membership basis you can work there a lot of um you know there's a lot of couples that work there and uh one spouse will leave and the other will come they'll do that sort of thing but the interesting thing was um, one of the statistics that they said in um, in the UK, um, it could cost about to one third of your income or more uh, just for the child care. Yeah. And uh, one in seven women with children or something like that are freelancers. Yeah. It, it, amazing. I mean, you know, they got the, the data right. You know, it's sort of um, really impressive brand, you know, and the, certainly check out Cuckoo's. And how do you spell that? It's C U C O O C Z. I think there's an L or a V in there somewhere. Yeah. No, it's C U C K double O Z. Right. Dead. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nest. But fantastic, great yeah. brand. So I think that that's pretty cool. So uh, you know, here we're starting to see a real merging of a lot of different sectors and segments. It's really um, as the, we in the business like to say, blurring the lines between yeah. all the different categories. And uh, I felt like that was another type of uh, situation that was coming up in conversations at the uh, Service Department Summit Europe in uh, in, in London. Um, you know, Art, what were some of the other big things that you saw when it comes to uh, how all of these segments seem to be becoming united in new and interesting creative ways well, i think that's the thing i think the, the word is united you know i think historically it's a sector that's been fairly sort of broken up and fairly siloed it we, what we're really seeing now is people coming together to raise the volume on the sector and i think that that has to happen more you know more people have to be aware of these fantastic products right yeah i would highly recommend um you folks out there in the uh, the investment side of the community to really start to take a, a, a look at this as a matter of fact um one of the folks that we talked to that's de- that's actively developing um, these a- a- apartment type hotels also is developing a, uh, a hotel from a major hotel brand, right? A-, a select service type of major hotel brand. So we're seeing a lot more now of that interaction between 
the, you know, on the real estate side between traditional hospitality and service departments. So again, this is the reason why I keep talking about this is my agenda is to help all of you understand that this is a very critical change that's happening. We already know that in the United States, 27% of extended stay, ho- wait, 27% of the new construction pipeline is in the extended stay category. So, you know, think about that for a little bit minute uh, of a minute and, and see how significantly this change is happening and this big wave is creating and people's customers uh, behavioral changes are occurring and these new concepts are really starting to uh, to meet the needs so as the major hotel brands are doing a great job and they're doing what they're doing don't close your eyes to all this other opportunity that's there available uh, to you as well yeah i mean it's sort of you know it's an opportunity sort of to invest in hospitality without the huge overheads that can go into you know building a hotel that has full service everything right you know it's sort of i think you know certainly the trend with the service department sector and apart hotels is you know embracing the neighborhood and embracing the businesses the restaurants the bars around them for sure but before we talk about the importance of that i i it occurred to me that um, you're also, when you say it's an apartment hotel, an apart hotel, you're setting this stage of expectation where people you know, will get some of the hotel amenities, but they don't think that they're necessarily going to get the full panoply of services. So it kind of changes the dynamic. And for some reason, whenever I stay at these properties, I don't look at a lack of uh, or, or not having made service every single day as a deficit. I see it as an element of if I was living within the that community so it's an interesting uh, observation about how perceptions are changed so much just by you know creating the right elements and i I would argue being part of the neighborhood and having that openness to the community adds a big uh, point to that that shift in in brains it is the difference between staying in a city and living in a city that's the way i always look at it yeah you know and i know what i prefer to do and i know what a lot of people prefer to do now yeah you know you don't want to be in that hermetically sealed you know environment you want to get out there and live like well it's that yeah cliche yeah. live like a local hey listen place. let me tell you i lived like a local because i enjoyed the apartment that i stayed in in london right uh i was right near the for anyone who knows the underground by the bayswater underground tube yeah. station and um the first day i got there i arrived at like 11 in the morning blah 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 six seven o'clock time for dinner um I went over to an Indian restaurant that I had checked out on a, a, a website. I knew it was going to be pretty darn good. And I get there, and I'm like, you know what? I think I'm just going to do takeout, <laughs> you know? And I got takeout in my London neighborhood, and I walked home, and I had a, a full kitchen to, uh, you know, get a fork from, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and I you set, didn't have to eat sitting on your bed. And, and I yeah. set myself up at a yeah. table. And I watched some TV like a proper businessman on the road, and I ate some amazing shrimp curry, and I'm a better man for it, Art. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> that, that is living like a local. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, any other big lessons to, to, to take away from the service department summit? Oh, thanks for that. I think um, – what have we got? You can edit this pause out, can't you? Uh, I can, but I bet that's not going to happen. So you better <laughs> you better come up with something quickly, Art, or else or, or else we could just say you know it was a, it was a, it's it was great. Yeah. I mean, again, it's everyone seeming to be more and more working together, you know, and we're seeing more and more different faces at these events. You know, seeing more and more you know people from Switzerland, Germany. You know, Germany seems everyone's talking about Germany. You know, mm-hmm. that that's the a big growth area. So yeah. So uh, one, I think the big observation um, before we wrap up that I'll come away with in terms of the uh, how the sectors are doing, and I'm speaking specifically to Europe. For um, also, I, I feel like uh, London in particular has been a real hot spot for the development of this whole category. And Europe in particular has, um, I think, really visibly at least maximized it. I can't speak to how many units there are in the United States, but Europe seems to be much more developed, much more mature market. So uh, what you're seeing now is there's a huge influx of new um, properties coming in. And uh, here in London, it's actually causing a little bit um, drop in occupancy mm-hmm, and uh, mm-hmm. ADR and that sort of thing. Uh, Glasgow, the same sort of stuff. Oh, and this is all information I learned from uh, HVS during a, a presentation at the Service Department Summit. They said, um, you know, in Glasgow, uh, there's something like 300% more new ho- <laughs> new uh, service departments coming in than already exist. So there's a lot of people getting uh, into this. So I would uh, argue that you need to do your, your homework. However... Absolutely. However, the interesting twist on this is 
everyone seems confident that the demand is there because as these new switches are being turned on, such as real-time bookability on BridgeStreet.com, um, more people are becoming aware with it. So there's almost uh, an unusually large explosion of demand, I think, that's on the horizon. I think that's it, and it's raising awareness, you know, whether or not that, that's through marketing or however, I think that well, is well, Airbnb has raised awareness of the entire category, and I think that there's yeah. a halo effect that's happening, yeah. and people are seeing, oh, I don't have to stay in some um, person's house or this thing that this guy rents out. I can stay in a professionally managed place that's um, different than the traditional hotel experience that gives me what you said before, the live like a local experience, but I could feel uh, confident in my stay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. I think... uh, I think that's I think that's pretty much it, Art. Unless uh, unless we could spend, you know, I know what we should do. We should spend the next two hours talking about that croissant I had this afternoon. He he had the it was that the croissant of your life? It was pretty darn good. I can't say it's a croissant of my life because there's many more to be had. <laughs> <laughs> so far, yeah. So I think I'm gonna I think we're gonna end this segment. I'm gonna have myself a glass of wine. Maybe we should maybe get some escargot or something of something like that. You're going for it tonight. I yeah. don't. I don't know. It depends what time. Um, it depends what time uh, producer Art makes me get up to do shooting you, you tomorrow. You haven't talked about the burger you ordered today. Oh, the, oh, the burger that I ordered. All right. So, uh, rookie mistake. <laughs> rookie mistake. And I want to thank all of my uh, friends, family, fellow countrymen, expatriates, everybody I know on the planet who knew that I was going to uh, to, to France and didn't tell me that if you order a hamburger. That it pretty much comes uh, raw. But this one wasn't even <laughs> raw. This one, like, seriously, Art, I cannot believe how raw this thing was. It, 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 was, it was like I heard the castle crying in the, in the kitchen. It was like that. In fact, I think I saw your burger being cooked. The chef took the burger, you know, <laughs> got it close to the grill, hovered it over there, said, yeah, no way, and then put it on your plate. And you guys, you guys loved it. I was not prepared for that. I ate around, um, I ate around the, uh, the, the edges on it. You did pretty it. well, actually. I was, it was a brave effort. Yeah. <sighs> I should have just eaten the cheese plate like I thought <laughs> I should have had. This, this was a mistake. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We hadn't eaten. That's when I make the worst decisions. Best decision I ever made, having that croissant. So there you go. That, there we go. All right. So as you as you can tell right now, I make poor decisions and make good decisions. The best decision you can make is to look more into the service department sector. I highly believe it's really interesting. Extended stay is the place to be. No vacancy podcast is the show to listen to. This is Glenn Hausman. All right, Larry, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. All right. So stick around after the commercial break. We've got another great interview. And as you know, I have no idea which one I'm going to choose. I've got some really good ones still. I'm going to go figure it out right now. And when we get back from the commercial break, we'll find out together which one we have. Talk to you guys soon. See you on the other side of the commercial break. Listen up for Red Roof. Bye. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. Hey, everyone. Glenn here. So a couple of months ago, I had Andy Alexander, he's the president of Red Roof, on this exact podcast. And we we did it during the AHOA conference. And let me tell you, I got to know a lot about the Red Roof team and the brand. For example, did you know Red Roof offers one of the highest rev pars in the economy segment and has been number one in online guest reviews eight years running, according to Clarabridge? Well, they're careful to make sure standards reflect guest experiences. They're fully tested and well-priced. In fact, they manage about 20% of the system, so they have skin in the game, too. You know, a few years ago, also, another great thing they did is they introduced Red Roof Plus, a brand extension that created the upscale economy segment, and it's a great product with wood-like flooring, high-end bedding, spa-inspired baths, enhanced landscaping, and more, all based on customer research. And it's having a dramatic effect on owners' financial results. I know when I first saw it, I was blown away by how much you could do in an economy place to make it seem extremely upscale. I guess that's where they got economy upscale economy from. So more recently, they introduced the Red Collection, which is an amazing group of unique hotels that are city-centric, but also inspired by the vibe and culture of the neighborhoods in which they're located. And that gives franchisees the opportunity to affordably invest in new markets with a brand that has a solid track record. But the most interesting thing I learned? All from Red Roof franchisees themselves. Again and again, they tell me, genuine relationships, real results. It isn't just a slogan. It's just how Red Roof operates. Learn more by visiting redrooffranchising.com or call 888-473-8861 and tell them Glenn sent you. 
back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, your host, Glenn Hausman. Now, if you guys have not listened to the first half of the show because you want to go straight ahead to this amazing interview here, be sure to uh, register for our newsletter. Just text the word HOTEL. To 66866 is not easy enough, just 66866, and you'll get uh, all registered and get our Sunday night newsletter. But without further ado, which I never really understood because how much a doing is there in, in, in life, Mr. Larry Corman of AKA, how are you, sir? Hello, Glenn. How are you doing? It is doing so great, great to talk to you. I think you are like the uh, happiest, cheeriest, friendly guy in the service department business. We're pursuing our passion, my man, both uh, yeah. you and I, doing yeah. what we love. So instead of starting off with the typical questions, where do you get your positive energy from? I think for my parents, uh, they were both upbeat people. They learned how to laugh at themselves, yeah. sense of humor, SH, uh, SOH, very important. And, uh, again, going back to having the fortunate ability to do what I love and deal with where people live. So that's fun. All right. Yeah. So um, for those of you who don't know, AKA is a service department uh, company. You've got properties here in New York City where we happen to be recording this interview. Amazing properties. I had a chance to speak with you. Five um, and a half properties in New York. Five and, and a half. Say half because we have one in uh, Tribeca. <laughs> But it has not been transformed into an AKA yet, the Smith Hotel in Tribeca. Right. Soon to be transformed into AKA Tribeca in Q1. Uh, in, in Q1, okay. We always pick Q1 because it's quiet in New York. It's crickets in New York. So uh, opportunity cost-wise, uh, we try not to do any meddling with the asset during Q2, 3, and 4. So you don't think that you got to – oh, because you don't think We're that busy. you need to open before – before then to grab that fall I conference think traffic. So, but uh, I've yet to meet too many partners <laughs> who think so. So <laughs> I do agree. Yeah. You have one opportunity for a first impression. Right. Uh, but that's why we haven't put the AK name. So uh, I guess the resolution is we don't put AK on it. We keep it as Smith, Tribeca, and then do our renderings, go through the design process, do it the right mm-hmm. way, and then open anew. We'll close it for the first quarter and open anew on April 1st. And hopefully we're not fooling anyone. Yeah, well, good. I, I I like that. So I want to go. Uh, I want to go back in time because you do you do have an interesting company and an interesting corporate history that you you, you have uh, over there. So you. Uh your family basically, I think, invented this this kind of uh, business. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far. Maybe I'm not. If but you it really, go really far back to 110 years ago, yeah. my great grandmother was running out her farm home so they could afford to rent the farm. So she might have been even ahead of Airbnb in that respect. But that's my, interesting. So did they have instant booking capabilities at that time? They, they, they did not at that time. But there were farmers who also needed to make ends meet. And my grandfather, great grandfather, was a dress swept floors in a dressmaking shop, and that's. That's all he really wanted to do was become a dressmaker. She literally made enough money to buy the farm, and uh, my great-grandfather, along with his two boys, started developing the land, and the second generation started building homes. The third generation developed apartments, and my father, who was part of that third generation, created the world's first furnished apartment. All right. Well, let's, his, not, let's not go too okay. fast, too <laughs> quick, because this is so rich. First of all, when, um, when, when she went around saying she wants to uh, buy the farm, I hope people didn't think she was suicidal. No, or they, like back that. then, I don't think they had right. that Okay, (laughs) that's good to know. She literally bought the farm. Yeah. So, uh, what's funny to me is that you know um, a lot of people in hospitality we talk about second generation, maybe third generation, but you have this in your blood. It's it's you know ever since your family came over here to the United States of America, it's just been a part of 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 what you've done. Residential real estate, we bleed blue with that. It's four generations deep. It's the only thing I've known since age two, going with my dad on the weekends, starting on the summers at age ten. So that's what I know is home, and it happens to all. Also collide in a beautiful way with my passion, which is design, architecture, all those elements. Now I'm a little concerned that you bleed blue and not green, being that you're from <laughs> Philadelphia, right? I ble- I bled green this year okay. with the Eagles, <laughs> absolutely, and blue for Villanova, so the blue comes back. Uh, okay, right, uh, and you know, and I guess if you, it's funny because originally our corporate colors were blue, so I say that, but uh, they're now mm-hmm. Fifty Shades of Gray, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is uh, kind of kinky, especially yes. if you're uh, if you're operating to be in this apartments. industry, a little kinky. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. To stay ahead of the curve. Oh, so let's let you know. Let's go to uh, where the germination of the current iteration came. Um, you, you, your family had this this apartment building, and just kind of take it from there because you know where I'm going. My father's father built a white circular building in Philadelphia in the '60s, which it was, was kind of, of like a, which was kind of in vogue at the time. It to build was in that very ahead of, of its style. time, and so ahead of its time that nobody in Philadelphia wanted to rent a pie shaped apartment. Why do you think that was? 
because it was pie shaped. I think it, it was just that, too, the only reason. Really? Uh, it's just like oh, it's too narrow over here, it and it's too wide over here. It's cheese uh, steak shape. They might have, but I think pie <laughs> shape just didn't lend itself well. It was triangular bedrooms, triangular living room. No real kitchen. It was a small small kitchen. But uh, people started to come in and say, well, I'll take the model for three months, four months. And my father recognized an unmet need between that of a daily stay of a hotel and the annual lease of an apartment. So he saw there was something there. He worked with some rental furniture companies to guarantee payment of that. And along the way, people asked for a toaster. How about maid service? How about a TV? And that was the birth of the first furnished apartment in 1966, 52 years ago. And since then, we have been evolving it and taking it to the next level, and I think with AK right. is the fullest expression of that furnished it, residence. It, it really is, and um, when we were here for the Service Department Summit Americas back in April in uh, New York City, I got to see a couple of these properties, and I urge you all to check out this great video I did with your Wall Street area property. What a on, beautiful day. That was awesome. What a beautiful view. day on the roof. Great video. You can check it out at NoVacancy uh, no com as well as the YouTube channel for uh, Bridge Street Global We've taken the furniture department to such a high level that that rooftop terrace is also an outdoor movie theater that we partner with Tribeca Film. So to that high of a level from... A pie-shaped apartment. I love. I, I love that. But let's get back. Let's get back to the pie. All right, and uh, you know, mostly because I think it's delicious food. But uh, <laughs> but also, um, you know, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about that recognition process where he realized, oh, I could take this idea and move it beyond just this one unusual building that I have. Well, my father's first uh, priority was just to run up that building. He then recognized that there was a rate higher than that of an apartment that Mm -hmm. seemed like a great value compared to that of a hotel. So where they overbuilt apartments, he used a small amount of furnished apartments to make up the difference Mm -hmm. needed for the uh, overcost in building. And saw that there was that higher rate of return. What we have since done in the 80s when I graduated from Duke and started Corman Suites with my dad was brand those 23 apartments and sort of create a a business where you would have apartment expenses coupled with hotel revenues. So we would maximize or optimize the net operating income and then uh, that allowed us to take ourselves from sea level apartments to B level right. apartment communities in Atlanta, North Carolina, to eventually A level uh, condominiums in New York City, where we could add the hotel services and amenities. Right. So at some point, you realized, oh, instead of just renting these out for a year, we could make a lot more money by having people stay short-term and really maximize our investment. If I said $6,000 apartment rent, that would sound exorbitant. Mm-hmm. If I said $200 for an apart- a hotel suite, that would sound really affordable. Right. So we recognize there was a need to optimize the revenue, but at the same time operate with maybe 25 team members as opposed to 200 employees. Hmm. That, that's really, really fascinating. So what was it like going about creating this whole industry, you know, with your grandfather and, and y- your father that didn't exist? I mean, there was nobody to tell you couldn't do it, but there was also nobody out there with the models that you could do it. I think the first challenge was to communicate it to a very small population, albeit Philadelphia. There wasn't the Internet. There wasn't cable TV. So we could take the billboards. We had Howard Stern do our first uh, radio Seriously? commercial. We did. <laughs> uh, 80 commercials, $80,000. I wrote a script for him. He didn't stick to the script. I was very upset. I didn't know of Howard Stern at the time. This was 1988. And they said, trust me, that's a good thing that he went off. And it certainly resonated with Philadelphians. And the key concept that we drove home with commercials, billboards, apartment guides, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer was twice the space at half the cost. So you have to have a simple message. And we were saying you get the benefits of home with the services of hotel. So it was really delivering a simple message. And we were the only ones delivering that message at the time. I, I got to tell you, I watched um, I watched the David Letterman show last night on Netflix where he interviewed Howard Stern. It didn't come up in their conversation. I don't, I don't understand why. Alec Baldwin why. brought it up on Howard Stern's <laughs> show recently uh, because that's where he used to stay at AK Central Park. And his brother stayed there. And it was the only place they could go out and not be bothered. Interesting. Uh, was at our lounge because it's private. Uh, and that's part of what right. we sell here in New York is anonymity. I was about to say, yeah, you do that whole thing without anonymity and I, I wish I could afford to stay in your places because you've got a lot of great people that the stay longer these. length you stay the less you pay so it might be 995 for one night we really try not to do daily but we're trying right. to do a daily rate to show the value for staying weekly which would be 695 395 if you commit to monthly so we really reward uh, the longer length stay so at what point did you um, you you realize that um, dealing with captains of industry and Hollywood Studios doing productions was a great way to uh, fill up those rooms that is a great question, Glenn, because a lot of people see that I'm involved with the movie industry. I'm chair mm-hmm. of the Philadelphia Film 
uh, Festival um, right. on the board of BAFTA LA and Tribeca Film, and it really came about. We appealed to Fortune 500 companies. When we came to New York and opened up four properties within two years, right. it was at the nadir of the economic uh, collapse. The epicenter was here in New York, so those type of people did not... Uh, come to us. There wasn't that demand for new companies training. Mm -hmm. So we appealed to individuals and corporations, executives that wanted to fly under the radar. They wanted to assuage their need for cachet location. But we also recognized in good times, bad times, movies are being made. And we appealed to the technology component with Silver Cup, Kaufman, Astoria, Steiner Studios, where they needed a residence while they were filming eight weeks, 10 weeks. And we captured in about a two-year period, 80% of any film or TV production. We had the producers, directors, stars, staying with us because it appealed to their need for space, having a kitchen, being able to watch the dailies in their living room, uh, still being a value in terms of cost uh, with the space and the location. So it really was, again, by mistake, this horrible economic collapse that wow. forced certain people to give us an opportunity. They didn't know Akka from AK or right. any of that. We just were in the locations like 58th and 5th where they wanted to be, and we were at a price point and a space point that met their need. And they could put it on their expense form. And people wouldn't say Four Seasons, Plaza, right. Saint, they saw AKA. Oh, that's, that's so both that's involved at the same time with the film industry, yeah. uh, production, and uh, that corporate executive. I, I think about uh, I had a time in my life. It's got to go back now, thirteen years ago. I'm remembering because the age of my uh, my kids at the time. Um, I used to do PR for uh, the, the Four Seasons in New York, right? And it was the middle of one time when the, the the owner was um, redesigning and then redesigning and then redesigning those rooms over and over and over and over again, right? And it was really interesting to see all the celebrities that would come in and out of there, and they couldn't move without being flocked by people. The first celebrity that stayed with us 14 years ago was Diane Keaton, mm-hmm. and she said she felt like she was on a silver platter at the plaza. And what she loved is that she could walk into our lobby at Sutton Place. Nobody was there. There was one person who knew her name, said hello, but really gave her space. She could work out, go down into the pool, take a, a, a swim, go back up in the elevator, into a residence, have breakfast, come down, walk the neighborhood, and nobody knew she was there. And it really gave her that sense of pied de terre on mm-hmm. demand. Right. And we felt we had some special. Richard Gere since then has stayed with us multiple times at multiple properties. Uh, a lot of stars love that anonymity. They love their residence. It's their home. It's done at a level they would do their own condominium, yet they come and go as they want. The, their service is there when they need it, but they have their privacy and intimacy when they want that as well. Uh, I love that because I, I, you know, the whole idea of, of fame for someone like me is like, oh, this would be awesome to be recognized all the time. But then – it can be extremely suffocating, and to go out and to have that public persona, you want a place to come back and be able to recharge and not have to have all that stress. Absolutely. And we, we have some of the top celebrities, some of the top politicians who they have to have that uh, pause for the cause or just that ability to get away, and home should be that place. And the definition of home has changed for so many people, uh, whether they want flexibility, they want space, but for a large amount of people, they want anonymity. They just want home to be home, where it's left to themselves. So outside that particular audience, what types of customers are you bringing in? Because, um, yeah, sure, I could stay a long time. The price point is going to go down and down, but it's not inexpensive to stay anywhere in New York City, especially where some of your amazing properties are right on Central Park, I think with the exception of the production communities and some of these executives who are going through a divorce or renovating, we've really appealed to a global audience. Uh, People in Asia and Europe always understood the concept of a service residence, that you had an apartment on a tree line a street, you got to understand the pulse of a, and spirit of a community, not just going one or two or three days and saying it a Four Seasons or a Marriott. So we really appealed to a global citizen that valued uh, privacy, intimacy, anonymity, but also valued design. We're the first ones to really hire some of the top designers to add a level of scale, a level of decor that enhance this uh, feeling of calm, a minimal, contemporary minimal design. Uh, So I think it was uh, a global citizen that we appeal to, and I think the advent of the Airbnb has really helped uh, communicate the advantages of a residence over a hotel room, a room versus a residence, uh, domestically. What I'm just fascinated by, um, uh, Larry, is that um, you can be so successful without having a brand that's a household name, and you're able to pull that off really, really well. I think we really embrace the fact that we weren't known because part of AKA in and of itself is a double entendre, also totally. known as right. yeah. or a Corman accommodation. But 
what we're saying and communicating is anonymity and this level of calm. Part, if we were a household name, that would sort of go against the concept of being anonymous. Right. So I think we have that feeling as if it's word of mouth is the only way in which we generate business. It's not. We use search engine optimization like anyone else. It's our quasi-international reservation system. Mm-hmm. But that word of mouth is still the most credible form of marketing. And if it becomes sort of like an inside secret, here's where you'll stay, right. it goes hand in hand with the message we're trying to communicate of anonymity. Right. So it almost uh, it's almost an extra added benefit to uh, to have that you know that quietude that's uh, back. Certainly, the, the way we started out 14 years ago to put that on an expense report that I stayed at AK. They're like, right. well, it's not Four Seasons, it's not Ritz Carlton, it's not the Plaza. Okay, it's all right. You, you didn't take advantage of uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so part of that did work early on to help brand us. Now that AK is a little bit better known with people in New York. Part of it is they understand, well, you're staying two weeks or three months. That makes sense. Stay there. The value component is that it's 70% less of one of those expensive hotels on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So So it still works towards that. And you're going out to L.A.? We've, we've been in uh, Beverly Hills for about eight years, AK Beverly Hills. It's one of our most successful properties, and we, uh, a year ago today, uh, uh, acquired a property in West Hollywood right at the legendary 8500 Sunset nice. Boulevard location where they filmed 77 Sunset, and Dino had his lodge. There's a Fred Siegel there and a Bill Chait restaurant about to open next week, so pretty cool. uh, it's been a... a, a Two really good properties for us uh, in Los Angeles. Well, West Hollywood has really been uh, transforming over the last five, six, seven years. In some ways, they're very creative. In other ways, they're not. They would prefer us be annual apartments. This idea of monthly, uh, they're getting used to. There's a very strong hotel presence in West Hollywood. They'd rather not have a disruptor like AKE come in, even though they average about three days and we average about three months. Right. Uh, so in some ways, West Hollywood is very progressive, but they have not welcomed us with the same open arms that Beverly Hills has. That's strange because of the type of clientele that you're sharing with me that you have stayed at these places. You think that they would love to be able to have that little underscore to the community. Completely agree. We have been uh, dealing with them for several years. They Mm -hmm. would love AK in West Hollywood. We wanted to be in West Hollywood. We thought it was a match made in heaven. But I think this location had so many iterations to it over a 20-year period that I think whatever would have ended up there would not have uh, uh, satisfied everyone. So right. I think they're sort of w- waking up to realizing that there's a need for what we do. I think when they had the fires and people were out of their homes, they were looking for a place. Uh, there's children that go through chemotherapy that uh, the parents want a home for them. Uh, as opposed to three hotel rooms, they can cook a meal in the kitchen. They can sit in the living room. They can do laundry. So I think they're slowly but surely warming up to our offering. They always wanted it there. Right. It's just in a very special Special location, so uh, we're that sweeter fruit on the farther limb uh, in West Hollywood. But we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I find that interesting. Now, you mentioned Air- uh, Airbnb is helping to bring visibility to to your brand, aka as well as the entire segment. But it also brought visibility to your brand and the entire segment. And a lot of jurisdictions are having a hard time with the relationship that Airbnb is uh, is changing the dynamic. Here in New York City, where we're recording this particular interview, um, there's been a real push-pull. There's some, you know, saying, oh, all of these Airbnb apartments are starting to affect real estate prices adversely, sending them sky high, which is good in a way because it, real estate value is increasing, but it's also it could be damaging to the texture of the neighborhood. So you're seeing more legislation and stuff be put into place. How would, are you thinking about dealing with that? And what's your strategy there? Because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky component, man. Uh, another great point. I think uh, anybody who says that the hotel industry, especially someone like us who are on the periphery right. with residences, uh, has been hurt uh, mm-hmm. by Airbnb and OTAs in the last four years. If New York had 50,000 hotel rooms and it went to 100,000 with oversupply, uh, additional supply, uh, then 65,000 Airbnb residents, all of a sudden you've gone from 50,000 to 165,000. Then you're taking uh, a lower occupancy, a lower rate, and giving a larger chunk to uh, OTAs. So in our industry has been hit hard. I think what the cities and the localities, uh, local groups have understood was that if one group is uh, told they have to have life safety measures, sprinklers, smoke purge, uh, backup generators, where they have to have a certain amount of ADA handicap accessible suites, right. uh, if they have to hire That's local right. union hotel employees. Uh, uh, now you're talking exactly what the apples. AHLA is is pushing. They, um, they're they all about the level playing field argument, which makes a lot of sense to me, but also as an outside observer, it almost kind of, kind of feels like a, a little bit of a, a, a cop-out because... You, 
but I don't know what else they could do. Well, I think what you said with uh, apartments, if it's an apartment-centric city like New York, yeah. and somebody's living in an apartment and somebody starts gobbling them up and operating a quasi-hotel, a de facto hotel illegally, right. they're forcing the rate up, uh, the apartment rate, monthly rental rate up on all the others living there. If you bought a condo and the person next to you every week is some different group, oh, yeah. you're going to be upset. So I'd be, I think I'd be pissed you have off, both man. sides yeah. of the aisle. I think right. you have the hotel unions seeing their housekeepers lose job. You have hotel uh, owners seeing rates going down, costs going up, and then you have apartment renters who are upset because their rates are going up. You have condo people upset because they don't know who their neighbor is. So I think all that these cities are trying to do is create a level playing field. Agreed. So if you're mom, pa, kettle, and you lost your daughter to college or to something else and you want to fill that while you're there, I don't think the city has a problem that doesn't have the life safety right. or the other elements. But if you're a guy trying to be a hotel operator but not pay taxes That's right. and not hire a hotel union or do that, and you're going to run up a bunch of ho- uh, apartments and low price, ho- then you're going against the spirit of what the city intended with these rules. So I think what they're trying to do is go after that 30% of units that are being rented or residents being rented on a daily, less than 30-day basis. Right. And your your business model is 30 days or more, essentially, although there are instances where you have less. But you also have an entire building, so you don't have it like a, I'm a resident and there are strangers on my floor every day. We always anticipate our uh, offering being two weeks to three months. What happened was right. New York became a tale of two cities when Paris uh, changed that law in two, May 2011. We have two properties that are in a residential district, Southern Place and United Nations, that even if you did all the life safety uh, procedures for two, two and a half million dollars, you still could never do less than 30 day stays. But then we had two properties in a commercial district, Central Park and Times Square, where if you came in over a two year period and put life safety uh, things in, then you could do daily. We never intended to do dailies, but we did start doing weekly and at the other property we've stayed with the monthly. So it did create a tail two season. We got hit harder at the R2 properties, Southern Place UN, because we had two hands tied behind our back, one with rates and one with length of stay. Hmm. Where we only had one hand tied behind our back at Central Park and Times Square. Right. Okay. All all that makes sense to me. I'm wondering how much. Just coming to to my it's my mind right now, so it may not be completely clear. But I always looked at you know renting by the week as a low end economy type of a thing growing up. Right. Like not even knowing extended stay. Right. Not even Zinga. not even knowing your whole world uh, existed. For example, I think of like you know uh, Steagle Apartments in Vegas or something like that that appealed towards uh, the real economy segment. That um, you know uh, resident neighborhood would say, oh, an element is coming into to town that we don't want to have That part of here. Airbnb didn't help uh, right. assuage any change with. Uh, right. And you're right. Extend State always had, even corporate uh, apartment had a lower end connotation or perception. So we did have to change it and we're still in the midst of doing it. Yeah. And that's where the word of mouth, where people come in and say they're condominiums, they have the highest end design component, uh, hotel services unlike anything they've seen. So it's that change that we're still communicating and connecting to a wider audience, the uh, collateral material that Flux Labs has done with us over the years, mm-hmm. really uh, where words, uh, uh, pictures worth a thousand words, right. really seeing the video and the ads is worth hundreds of thousands of words that we're able to show that this isn't. Uh, your mother or grandmother's uh, right. extended stay. Yeah, it, it, you've turned uh, something. You've turned this into an aspirational product for somebody like me. And that's really, at the end of the day, we're trying to provide the sense of home as that word home has changed. Home is where the heart is, and we put a lot of heart in each uh, individual suite. But it's really having the amenities, uh, the basics, championing those basics, right. cleanliness, uh, hospitality, uh, presentation, design. All those elements go along with the bells and whistles of services and amenities that uh, differentiates us from those past uh, expectations or lack of perception. So what's, what's next after you open up uh, the next one in, in April? Our plans are really to uh, solidify our operations, which have improved greatly this year because I think there is that uh, level playing field and right. because a lot of the construction at the properties has culminated because we've done a little construction each year rather than, as we said earlier on, close mm-hmm. it all down, do it the right way. So right. I, I, I really would like us to solidify our operations at the 12 existing properties. At the same time, we're working with some new partners and existing partners to grow globally and really be a, a, view our business and our economy as a global one. And to have properties in cool cities like uh, uh, Paris and Rome and expand our portfolio in London, but also be in 
uh, cool global cities that aren't necessarily on the tried and true hotel right. uh, track. Yeah, we haven't really talked. We haven't really. San we haven't Sebastian. Had, yeah, some other- we haven't at all talked about London in this conversation. Um, London seems to me to be the um, the center of the universe for the service department kind of a, of a business. What's it like operating there compared to other markets such as New York, Philly, and maybe L.A., which it's not as common. The irony is our pedigree does uh, go back to London. Right. My, my really? father took that same white circular building in 1978 and partnered with Lord Forte mm-hmm. of Trust House Forte to create the first all-suite hotel in Philadelphia, the first in the country. Uh, and he had some of the great hotels around the world, the Plaza Athene and George Sank in Paris, uh, Grosvenor in uh, in London, the Westbury in New York. I, uh, that building was shaped like a cake, though, not a pie. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually did my hotel management training for four yeah. months in Torquay, Southwest Devon, yeah. in 1983. So some of my background in hotel management, some of my father's experiences uh, – emanate from London. So having a property in Marlebone was a dream come true for us. We love May- Mayfair. We couldn't necessarily afford Mayfair. Uh, and we were able to get a small property mm-hmm. in Marlebone, fell in love with it. And uh, uh, there's a tradition to ho- hospitality in general, not hotel, just hospitality uh, that is unique. Even to New York, uh, the way in which they put flowers out, uh, the, the level of sophistication of the cab drivers, there's just an element to uh, London to hospitality that I, I would imagine Japan's at that level also. That's different domestically. So to have this global uh, connection and this global uh, mindset to our brand, you have to have a little from Japan and a little from England added to that element to, of what we're doing here locally. What's it feel like um, at, the, at this point in your career now where the consumer is really catching on to, to the, the concept and the idea? Does that... Um, open doors for you? Well, it's funny hearing Ian Traeger talk about this tough lux, uh, because all the things he's talking about we did 14 years ago here in New York, where we removed all the hidden costs, uh, the bellman and the room service, and provided a lot more space and value, all those components that he's doing now, uh, and Ian Schrager somebody I idolize. So uh, I say that to him with the greatest compliment because I thought what he did, the drama uh, and the wow effect uh, was inspiring to me. But to hear him, somebody I admire, talk about, well, you know what, let's deal with the basics. Let's give good value. Let's give a great residential experience. Let's have meaningful communal spaces as opposed to the non-meaningful. That was sort of uh, nice to hear. And I think uh, what we're doing is trying to take that concept respectfully, not more than two or three properties a year, but broaden our horizons uh, and have those uh, offerings elsewhere in the world so that tried and true residents here can also go right. other places in the world as they do with Amon, the Amon junkies. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, my guess is because you are a closely held family company, you don't necessarily want to grow too big too quickly because then all of a sudden it changes the dynamics of Absolutely. why you've been successful up Absolutely. till now, right? We've been averaging one property per year. In the last two years, we've done two. You can't take on more than that being a small company. And we're a small company. We've got some of the best financial partners on planet Earth. Uh, They like to remain anonymous, so I don't mention them often. But uh, they are family. There would not be an AK without them. And we're going to grow with them respectfully so that we're always mindful of what their intentions are with this uh, program, uh, as well as our team members to provide that level of growth and opportunity for them and to do it in a way where each individual property stands on its own and that we're something specific for someone, not everything to everyone. We've had eight years of great financial growth and we're really at a place right now that's amazing. How do you not get tempted to change your dynamic and jump in and all of a sudden become a much larger company because I know you can if you wanted to. There's two answers to that. One is while it's been great economic growth uh, for everyone uh, other than the hotel industry oh, right. and we're part of the apartment and hotel and condo industry, uh, Blue Ocean all in one. It has not been as great because of the oversupply. So much has been built new because of Airbnb, mm-hmm. because of OTA. It's really this year that we're starting to spread our wings and have some success financially. But even with that said, if there was this overwhelming financial success, we still would limit ourselves because you got to kiss a lot of toads to find that prince. And there's just not that many great properties available that have the potential in a great location to become what we envision an AK to be. And once you set a standard, you don't want to go, you don't want the next one to be below that standard. You want to continually find that higher expression of what an AK could be. I think that 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 all makes a lot of sense. Are you typically find an existing asset? Is that, is that what you're, you're, 
your, your formula? For our Av brand, we build exactly what we envision. So our last two have been in Florham Park next to the Jets facility, mm-hmm. and they're the Nate Plus Ultra of what you would envision a mid-rise apartment slash furnished apartment right. to be. We have not done that yet with AKI, ironically. We have renovated historic buildings. We did build a brand new one with Brandywine. It's their building, uh, and we have the top uh, 20 floors of a 50-story building. Wow. We have a uh, spectacular 28,000-square-foot 28th floor that has an indoor uh, stainless steel pool and wow. a movie theater and indoor golf and everything you can envision. Uh, but we haven't built scratch up exactly what we envision, and I, I hope to do that one day. I ho- hope to uh, be a part of a creation of the uh, optimal AKA. We haven't done that yet, but I think part of the definition of AKA is to find really special historic buildings right. and repurpose them and breathe new life into them. Yeah, and there's, uh, you know, I've said this a thousand times before, so I apologize to everyone uh, listening, but I love adaptive reuse buildings. I love because it's the best way to have the true character and history of a neighborhood while having the palette from which to create something new and exciting. My favorite buildings in Europe are the ones that are three, four hundred years old and then ultra minimal contemporary interiors within them. I love that right. uh, coupling. Uh, I think with the exception of the one out of 12 that we was built new, we could justify it as because there was... Uh, there was just space, and we added place to that area. There was nothing there. It was the train tracks by University of Pennsylvania, Drexel, CHOP, the train station, and there was no residential. So the idea of building new was okay, but I prefer, as a Lewis Kahn disciple uh, living in his last residential commission, being involved for 20 years with Penn Design, I love the idea of taking a special building. We've taken two Horace Trumbauer buildings, and to breathe new life, as you said, that adaptive use, and to make it really special and to retain the integrity of its original architecture uh, and show it, case it to a new yeah. generation that can uh, appreciate it in a similar way. Before we, uh, before we wrap up, you know, being that you're a multi-generational uh, um, family business, did you grow up and when you were growing up, did it ever occur to you not to go down this uh, this? Journey? No, but my three kids, certainly it's occurred to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I always knew uh, that I wanted, uh, I love design. Uh, my family would go to sleep at night and I moved the furniture. I love the idea of architecture, especially meeting Lou Kahn at age 10. Uh, my father, who is such an upbeat guy. My mom as well both worked in the family business, so to be able to go with my parents on a weekend and play at the playground or get a Slurpee uh, at the 7-Eleven next to one of our properties, work there in the summers, work there on the weekends, uh, it just became something that I wanted to be a part of. I, ex- I was excited. I wanted to spread my wings, and my father mm-hmm. certainly allowed me to be entrepreneurial and do that, and uh, didn't care if I made mistakes, so he gave me a very open, positive form for which to experiment and have fun. So is that the same thing that you do with the uh, the folks that are working within your company? I, 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 I thought you were going to ask with my children. I don't think if I would, I no, would you're, be you're, as good with my kids. But your yes, children with already express no interest, so, you know. It, <laughs> with the team members, I respect the fact that that person who's managing the property, the managing director, is putting 100 hours a day. And so everybody else who's supporting that, I create an environment where they're there to help that individual. So the person running the team, I give full entrepreneurial power to. And there's certain elements you want to be consistently applied and certain ones you want to be the person – personality and the character of that individual running that property. So that property has its own identity. I never wanted to have a collection of properties that were me too. So I do encourage that entrepreneurial thing. I I want people to take chances. If it's wrong, we'll say, all right, let's not do that. Let's learn from that. And my role is really to share those stories from one property to the next. Here's some things that worked here. Here's some things that didn't work here. And really encourage that entrepreneurial spirit. Beautiful. I, I I love that. That's so that's so exciting. Is there anything that we missed that you wanna you wanna share? No, I just think it's a very exciting time in our industry, particularly service residents, because yeah. you see so many traditional hotels from Four Seasons of Marriott want to enter our arena, this little mm-hmm. blue ocean arena. So it's, it might be an indication that there's a strong need. It might be an indication that what we're doing has been exciting. Uh, but it's just an exciting time to see everybody on an equal playing field. There's so many different slivers from which to generate that business, whether it's from the these OTAs or from Airbnb forming a partnership. But I think the key to going forward will be establishing very important collaborations to create new synergies that didn't exist before. Beautiful. I, I love it. Well, uh, before we wrap up, you got to give yourself a shameless plug. How can people uh, find AKA? And uh, I love that. Uh, stayaka.com. That's all you need to do. One-stop shopping. Uh, as Hilton said, stop clicking around. You get the lowest Best available pricing. Become an AK insider at stayk.com. 
Excellent. Well, I'll be doing that, too, so I can uh, hobnob with Richard Gere and Diane Keaton. <laughs> They're there now. <laughs> Many others. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here, and I want to thank you all for listening. And remember, this is an exciting, brilliant business that is really bursting onto the scene right now, and you know I'm not going to stop covering it. So let us know what you think. Drop me a line, glenn at rouse.media, or find me online at Traveling Glenn on Instagram, Twitter, and wherever social media take you. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week. That is, unless I decide to, uh, you know, go off and open my own service department thank you Glenn. <laughs> thank you sir thanks so much for listening to no vacancy the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host glenn hausman online at rouse.media on twitter at traveling glenn and on facebook.com slash glenn.houseman we'll catch you next time